it was Messi, it was Suarez, it was Neymar. That attacking trio finished with 111 goals that season. Suarez himself with 37 goals and 16 assists. It felt like we had actually accomplished something, that we beat a European blue blood. It was over, it was over, especially on the away goals. It was a clinical moment in his career where he was saying, I'm going to make the difference. This isn't over yet. And then, of course, magic happens. PSG you could kind of say are an embarrassment of European football with how many times they failed in the Champions League and it all started with this match. If, if there's a major ripple effect to take from this would be that PSG kind of bankrupt Barcelona. La Remontada, the comeback, the greatest game in Champions League history to many. Six years on from that round of 16 second leg, we explore the argument that it was, in fact, the ripple effects from this very game that shaped Barcelona, PSG, and European football from then until now, and the teams and the game that we see today. Now, let's begin by understanding the landscape with which these two clubs found themselves going into this game, a game that has its own name, La Remontada. PSG came to the Camp Nou with a nearly unbeatable 4-0 advantage after an annihilation of the Catalans in Paris. During this match, Marco Verratti and Angel Di Maria put in star-studded performances, whilst Barcelona looked miles away from the European pedigree they had established for themselves. At that time, PSG fans were a little bit naive. We hadn't fallen on our face like this. Sure, we had lost and some you know, defeats were more difficult than others, but nothing on the level of... 6-1 uh, defeat. And so when PSG had won 4-0, we were kind of in a state of shock. Um, the way I like to describe it is uh, if you've ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, when Andy finally gets out, breaks out of prison, and he just looks up to the heavens with the rain. It felt like that. It felt like we had actually accomplished something, that we beat a European blue blood in Barcelona who had beaten us before, and we beat them 4-0. Like, it was just incredible. It felt like PSG had, with the rock hammer, just been chiseling for years and years and years. We finally had broken through. Going into the match, the PSG players looked somewhat nervy, walking out led by their captain, Thiago Silva, but looked like they possessed the confidence to see the game out. Barcelona came out to the 96,000 fans in attendance with their chest out and heads held high. The Champions League anthem rang out and perhaps got to the PSG players with the realisation of how huge a result it would be for the Parisians if they were to go through, but also if they were to go out. This was possibly evident in how Barcelona started the game. The moment the ball kicked off, perhaps shook PSG and Barcelona were able to capitalise upon this with Luis Suarez opening the scoring after just three minutes. When you are trying to score six goals, you have to try and build momentum. And so when the goals are scored, can often be quite important to sort of keep the hope alive. And that's what makes this game such a classic as well, is that... The f all of the goals are so weird, aren't they? The first goal is one where Luis Suarez sort of somehow gets a like looping lob header from about three yards that just about goes over the line. Talk me through the second goal, which is Marquinhos and uh, Kazawa's involved in it. Obviously, this is a you know this is people going to be listening to this. So the best you can can, can you remember that goal? Because that goal is so odd, and it's those kind of goals that make you start to think, what's going on here? I just think Barcelona, they got off to a great start. And as soon as that goal went in, as soon as Kurzawa made the mistake, scored the own goal, you could see. I remember thinking back and, and thinking, okay, the, you can kind of see the heads are going down. The the arms are, you know, the hands are on the hips. And the, you could see the, the spare starting to set in, in that cauldron of a stadium. Uh, the second half, uh, Lionel Messi gets himself that goal. And it's like, wow, okay, something's, something's really happening here. And then... Then there's the moment where watching it back, I feel like I feel like the the sole moment of karma is first Cavani scores a goal, so there's an element of redemption here because Kazal, who scored the uh, own goal, nods down the ball to Cavani, and Cavani with a fantastic finish, great goal, um, smashes it into the into the goal, and that means that you still that Barcelona still need three goals, but there was a moment when I watched it back, they all celebrate. And Angel Di Maria, Angel Di Maria puts his finger to his lip 
Now, obviously, I'm not expecting you to remember this because literally in that moment, you were probably going pretty wild at the time. But yeah. I do wonder, because we'll come back to Angel de Maria, but how do you feel when that moment happens? Because the way it's so alien to see the score being 3-1 on the scoreboard on the, you know, on the TV, yet Unai Emery is, is going, you know, it's going wild. They're all, they're all, they've all lost their, their heads here. Like, how did that feel? I mean, I mean, it was a great goal by Cavani, and you're thinking, okay, we've got an away goal. This was when away goals mattered. As, you know, the rules have changed uh, since. But when that goal went in, we're thinking, okay, we got a crucial away goal. As you mentioned earlier, PSG had won 4-0, so Barcelona didn't have any. So I thought that goal is, is going to be crucial. That might be what keeps us in this thing. And even if it's level on aggregate, we're going through. It was over. It was over, and especially on the away goals. Like, that was it. it was, the away goals reminder was, was the thing that made it over. In the 62nd minute when Cavani scored, I did. I had to go to work. I worked Major League Baseball at the time. And so I had to go to work within, like, an hour after the game ended. So I took that time to, like, make my lunch. I, I like, turned down the TV a little bit. I, Cavani scored. I was like, oh, whatever. So I actually put a half an eye on it. And so I went out, made my lunch, and said, yeah, it's definitely over. Even numerically, if they come back, the away goals are going to go to PSG. Because, again, it was 4 nothing the first leg. Um, yeah, how are they going to score three goals in the next you know, 15 minutes or so? And then, of course, magic happens. PSG launched a complaint against the referee, Dennis uh, Aitken, after the match for 10 refereeing errors. And there are a few in there that are so bad. And Angel de Maria, to come back to him, there's a moment where he gets put through. And Javier Mascherano <laughs> literally takes him out. It's, it's these kind of moments like, well, you know, have gone on to the sort of define um, PSG. And for that not to be called was, is one where you do sort of like, you know, your eyebrows change shape in that moment. And he obviously misses that chance. And that's, I think, in the 85th minute, the ball goes down the other end and Neymar scores an absolute peach of uh, a free kick. And... Yeah, the rest is history. Is there a moment that you can pinpoint where you thought something's really happening here? I think we're going to do this. I mean, it had to be the 88th minute goal by Neymar. It was the first one by Neymar. Because with that goal, you did kind of... The free kick. Exactly. Right. With that goal, you kind of went, oh, okay, they have momentum. Because again, not a reminder, but it was Messi, it was Suarez, it was Neymar. That attacking trio finished with 111 goals that season. Suarez himself with 37 goals and 16 assists. Talk to me about Neymar's performance in that game because, you know, he, he was never Messi and that's why he left or one of the reasons why he left. You could say it with full voice, like being the shadow to Messi. I mean, yeah, being Messi's shadow, I think, was... Yeah. We'll do it but later, but yeah, that was a huge part of that. But as far as the performance in that game, I mean, is that the best or arguably the best game of his career? Like, is, is that like, are, are, is that what we're talking about? I mean, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah. I th- so I, I think, you know, he is the main character of this story, the, of this game and of this Ripple Effect podcast for me because of everything that happens afterwards. But in the game itself, nothing happens unless this game happens and he performs that way. And the free kick in particular is, is so wonderful and necessary and without decision for me that was the, in terms of the genius of, of Neymar which we have seen possibly a little bit too fleetingly that moment for me I was like wow there was no there was no doubt it was it was a clinical moment in his career where he was saying I'm gonna I'm gonna make the difference this isn't over yet and I, I think that is something that we haven't seen that much and I don't think we saw that Neymar enough would you would you agree with that because i mean you kind of did you, that that was his best moment in the barcelona shirt for you yeah i mean i i, I think so i mean because i think after that he look at the way he takes the penalty which again happens less than t- two or three minutes later and the fact that messi says yeah of course suarez messi whoever it may be it's it's neymar i did think that at the time i thought why is messi not taking this penalty but so what had happened there Neymar was the hot hand. Neymar was the guy. And Barcelona would do this at the time. I mean, with that front trio, they scored so many goals. Like, there was a lot of times when Messi and Suarez, like, they would, they would give it to each other because it was, it was kind of like who's kind of earned it on the day and then things like that. And it was very diplomatic. Um, and I think with the Neymar thing, 
it's it's revisionist history because now we're seeing between Neymar and Messi and Mbappe and how that whole thing has gone for his career since then, right? Like that moment shouldn't have been the moment in in Neymar's career. Well, I think the the thing with PSG is he needed to he needed to do it on his own for it to be PSG. Yeah. If he does it now, if he you know if he wins the Champions League, which we're talking about, and get them over the line, he will have had the help of the best player for the last 15 years and the best player for the next 15 years. So it's not his anymore, uh, which was exactly the reason why, you know, it, apart from the financial gain, of course, why he, he made that, he made that move. So even that goal, you know, talking about ripple effects, the person that gets more than Neymar, the ripple effect of this game, because I think Neymar was always going to go to PSG, right? Sergio Roberto is the name to mention because Sergio Roberto scores that goal. I was going right? to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's funny because I don't want to. Yeah, I almost like minimizing your thing to be like, hey, let's talk about Sergio Roberto. But no, it's no, true. no, no, I get it. I get it. Winds up ex- because the because the fact is is that is he still at the club if he doesn't score that goal? Because actually, in the commentary of it, there were some quite discouraging comments about how bad he was in the first leg of that game and how kind of you know he was bordering on on competence slash inco- incompetent. So that goal meant everything for his career, right? He was Barcelona's, I think, last starter on the team sheet on a regular day. When the, when the 11 is healthy, he was the last name on that team sheet, right? And for him to come from the academy and just to kind of pop up, being Roberto, I think, made it matter a little bit more to Barcelona again because he is like the, you know, one of the, the sons, if you will, um, where you take all your superstars and Ronaldinho and Messi and Neymar and Koeman and whoever it was in the past, like those are the ones that win you the trophies, but it's also your own players, like the ones from your academy, the ones that are who didn't play for a long time and sat on your bench for years and years and years and kind of watched it all happen. And they're the ones that do it for the bads, right? And I think there's, there's definitely some romance to that. There's that touch of destiny about it, that it, that it shouldn't be him. Surely it it's going to be, be that, Suarez yeah. or it's going to be PK or it's going to be someone else. But for some reason it was him. And I think that is, that is an interesting part of it because uh, you really don't see him. You also I think that the the way the ball comes over as well. The ball comes out, goes in, comes out and then is lofted in such an odd way that it just your eyes are looking up and then your eyes look down and there he is. An unbelievable way to win a game. So this game could be described as Neymar's peak in hindsight. Neymar has since gone to PSG, of course, won trophies, but all of these accolades have been team-based accomplishments, such as winning the Ligue 1 title four times, winning the French Cup three times, and the French League Cup twice. But the hard-hitting fact is that he has never won a prestigious individual award since leaving Barcelona, something that was expected of him when he burst on the scene as a 17-year-old. The only time Neymar has won the League Player of the Year was in Brazil for Santos back in 2011. The Ballon d'Or eludes him, and it could all be down to peaking against his now club, PSG. I mean, it was... The worst season in, in QSI era history. I mean, not winning Ligue 1 is, was just unheard of. Um, but some guy named Kylian Mbappe at, at Monaco had um, different thoughts. And, and so PSG lost the league. And they were obviously knocked out in just embarrassing fashion. So there was always going to be kind of a retooling. Barcelona were foolish enough to put um, a buyout clause. They put a number on them. And PSG, they have unlimited funds. And so they said... Let's go ahead. Let's let's get them. And so they paid that amount, and there was really nothing Barcelona could do about it when there was interest from Neymar, and, and PSG had the, had the money. I'm a fan of the NBA, and the, recently there was a Kevin Durant trade to the Suns. And what has always been the case, whether it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the 70s or Kevin Durant now or Kevin Garnett in the late 2000s, whenever one gigantic superstar goes in one direction, and then you have to fill... Now, football's different because obviously you're spending money instead of getting players from the other team or whatever and trading for players. But whoever gets the superstar generally wins that trade or wins the exchange like 90% of the time, right? So losing one individual in Neymar was always a concern. The 220 million euros Barcelona received for Neymar was a pivotal part in their history and has led to problems ever since. The subsequent spending of that money has been a big part of their downfall and has highlighted severe incompetence in the Barcelona hierarchy, as Dan explains. Coutinho, 140 million. Dembele, 120 million. Paulinho, 35 million. 
He actually got 37 back, actually, on Paulinho. Yeah, so well done there. Nelson Semedo, 32 million. De La Feu, 10 million. Yeri Mina, uh, 10 million. The ripple effect here that's staring me in the face is that the, be- the beginning of the downfall is, is bizarrely taking that money, which, again, comes back, if we pull at the thread, from that game. Do you think you realised at the time how big of a, how well you needed to spend that money, and are you still amazed at how badly you spent it? No, I, I think at, even at the time, I think the numbers that you're speaking about, and uh, the main figure here becomes Jose Maria Bartomeu, because I think when you talk about the ripple effects, as boring as it is, the ripple effects to how this all affected FC Barcelona um, go down to Bartomeu, go down to the books and finances and the budgets and things like that. Because if anything, again, it's, it's all a domino effect that kind of began with the success of the 2015 Champions League because that Champions League gets him reelected. At the time, you know, when you win a Champions League, you don't want to upset anything, right? I mean, you want to keep everybody happy. More of the same. You want to, right, you want to exactly keep everything the same. So it's not even that money that wound up being the problem. It's that Barcelona, on the back of their own success, wound up breaking their own wage structure, something that they're still dealing with today, obviously. So just to clarify, what you're saying really is that although there's a clear ripple effect of that Neymar money changed the way we looked at transfers and the amount that we paid for certain players and so much so that you paid 160 million for Coutinho and that was obviously poor financial decisions but what you're actually saying is a similar idea of because Messi was on a certain amount of money those other players that shouldn't be anywhere near that the sort of the Coutinho's of that squad to be slightly disrespectful to absolute club legends it was the it was the wages that you were giving to those the other guys in the gang they should have been nowhere near where Messi's were there should have been a, a broader understanding that this is the greatest player of all time of course he earns that much more than you but when in, in your owner, you didn't have someone capable of making those decisions. If, if there's a major ripple effect to take from this would be that PSG kind of bankrupt Barcelona. So what are your final thoughts when I say to you, what was the ripple effect of this tie of La Remontada? There's hope in everything in football. Like there's always, there always should be a little bit of hope. And I think that, I know PSG doesn't hear that, but PSG against right now against Bayern Munich have a little bit of hope then